this is a um, this is an established hive. Uh, they have apparently been in this uh, location for a long time. Uh, the uh, dairy manager Kyle uh, told me that they found honey uh, running down the walls, which is a sign that it's been there for a, a good long while. Well, the crops that bees are needed for in California start off with the almonds, and then the blueberries about the same time, and then the cherries follow after that. One thing I like to do is I like to tuck my, <laughs> my pants into my socks, uh, just because uh, honeybees are curious. When you open up a hive uh, or you're transporting them, they crawl all over you. They get up on the suit, they crawl on your arms, and they are really curious about feet. With 1.3 million acres of almonds in production, we need about 2.4 million hives of bees that come from all over the country. There's two important things for, for almonds, to produce almonds. First, you need water, and second, you need bees. Uh, this is the la largest um, man-made pollination exodus in the world. In commercial agriculture, over 90 crops strictly re re rely on bees for pollination. Our kids really were not very much involved. They, they didn't really like getting stung. Ow, ow, ow. Oh. If it goes horribly wrong, try and edit it together so I look like I know what I'm doing, okay? Oh, you want to go find some bees? Production funding for American Grown, My Job Depends on Ag, provided by James G. Parker Insurance Associates, insuring and protecting agribusiness for over 40 years, by Garv Bennett. The growing experts in water, irrigation, nutrition, and crop care advice and products. We help growers feed the world. By Golden State Farm Credit, building relationships with rural America by providing ag financial services. By Brandt, professional agriculture. Proudly supporting the heroes that work hard to feed a hungry world every day. By Unwired Broadband, today's internet for rural Central California keeping Valley Agriculture connected since 2003 by Hodges Electric, proudly serving the Central Valley since 1979, and by Valley Air Conditioning and Repair, family owned for over 50 years, proudly featuring Coleman products, dedicated to supporting agriculture and the families that grow our nation's food. My name is Jake Wenger. I am the Assistant Professor of Entomology in the Department of Plant Science at Fresno State University. I think the general public understands that bees are important to the food supply. I think we've had great messaging on that uh, for the last couple of years. And uh, with the trouble that honeybees have been having, a lot of people are very aware of bees. I think where there's a little bit of confusion is that some people feel that, you know, if we didn't have bees, we wouldn't have food. And what it really comes down to, though, is that honeybees are more important for the diversity of food. Uh, my name is John Ballas, and We've been in the beekeeping business since the late 70s, early 80s. We started with a few hives, and right now we're small in the beekeeping world. We run about 100 hives. And I'm Lynette Ballas, and we've been working as a team for most all of these years. I uh, stayed home while we were raising our kids, didn't go out with the bees, but um, now that um, we're able to, we work together as a team and go um, work our hives. and do all of that stuff. Yeah, right now there's a million two hundred sixty thousand acres of almonds in production and usually it takes about you know two and a half to three hives per acre and so almond growers last year spent roughly seven hundred million dollars for bee pollination. So um, you know this time of year is is usually when we prepare for the almond bloom. The almond bloom uh, lasts several weeks out of the year comes pretty fast, lasts a little while and leaves. The earlier varieties mature any day now. Uh, we're getting our, our bees prepared and in place so that we're prepared for the almond bloom. Without bees, you don't have almonds. They're the livelihood of most agricultural crops. Yeah. Without them, we don't have pollination. So we as beekeepers are always work through the year so we have strong bees come February. So we just have a, uh, a wild beehive show up and they built a, an established colony inside one of the walls that separates our commodity bay. Um, it's gotten big enough now that it's, that it's uh, being, can be hazardous to my employees, so I thought it would be time to remove them. 
So yesterday I received an email from uh, Kyle Thompson, our uh, dairy director and faculty of dairy science. And he had a situation where in one of their commodity barns where they store cattle feed, they had a bee hive in the walls. Tell me now you, what you were just saying. You're worried about if the hive's a little big. What, why is oh, that? I only brought one hive box with me. So if we have more than about 10 frames of uh, brood in there, then I'm going to either have to get another box uh, cleaned out and get it all ready to go, or I'm going to start having to make hard decisions about what I want to save and what I don't. All right. We'll see what we have. Pretty cut and dry. And you can see over here, up on that wall, there's um, some remnants of old comb, right? So that's gonna be very attractive to bees. Honeybees, uh, they like they prefer to nest in places with old brood comb. They can smell it, uh, the brood comb being the comb that they raise their young in. And so if they were to just leave these up and they've got holes in the wall, like you can see here, they're probably just gonna keep getting bees over and over and over again. The honeybees, when they establish their hives, one of the things they cue in on right away is the um, smell of old brood comb. And so if we tear this one out, you're likely gonna get bees in this wall again. Yeah. So, yep. I don't know if you could, <laughs> I know money's tight at the moment, but uh, yeah, if, if someone- the holes. Yeah, it's just seal up the holes, that's all we really need. Yep. Just to discourage them. All right. Um, so I've got ladder. You're tucked in, you got a ladder. I've got crowbars. I've got crowbars. This is going to be fun. This is going to be so much fun. So that's the Watoki summer wildflower. That's from Reedley area. Well, through the year to keep hives healthy, starting in July, August, we start treating for the Varroa mites which really, if you don't treat for that, it really decimates the hives. So we're feeding uh, patties, which is a pollen substitute, syrup, and uh, medicating to knock down the varroa before we go into winter when the um, hives are semi-dormant. Yeah, a, tr a traditional almond orchard uh, will have uh, multiple varieties in it, somewhere between two and four varieties and the predominant uh, variety is nonpareil, and so that would be planted in one row, and then uh, the row next to it would be a different variety, which we call pollinators. And so in order for the nonpareil to be pollinated, uh, the bees will have to you know, carry the pollen from, from one variety to, to the next variety, and by doing that, then the whole orchard becomes pollinated. So essentially bees only have two food sources. They have nectar, which is their, uh, their carbohydrate, their sugar, and they have pollen, which is their protein. And a functioning hive needs both of those. Now, so when a bee is pollinating a flower, chances are they're searching either for nectar or for pollen. They're not usually looking for both at the same time. So when a bee comes up to a flower, it's either already looking for pollen or nectar, it lands on that flower, and then if it's looking for nectar, right, what it'll do is it'll scrabble down to the bottom of the flower, and it will look for the nectar, uh, sort of these natural repositories of sugar solution that the flowers make to encourage the bees to come. And they'll feed on that. Now, plants have evolved so that the, the stamen, right, that carry the pollen and the pistils that receive the pollen uh, to uh, reproduce are set up so the bees really can't avoid them unless they go all the way down into that nectary. So they have to touch that stamen and get some pollen on them in order to get that nectar. The bees use these roads here just like we use a road. And I like putting bees on this end of the orchard when the, the trees are running this way because the bees will go down the, the rows of trees just like we would walk down them. So in that way, they get good pollination. Another good place to put the bees is in the center of an orchard because they'll fly up and over the trees and then they, they can drop down into pollinating all the flowers that way. So they use sp specific routes and when you set down a hive, you can't move them even a couple of feet because they'll go back to that exact spot. So that's why we move them at night so they're all back in and we have to move them at least a mile or two. 
so they don't come back to this exact spot. So I've been involved in the almond industry for over 20 years, and uh, almonds, uh, you know, the the flexibility and uh, of the almond over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years in consumption has grown not only in the United States but worldwide. 80% uh, of the almonds grown. Uh, in the United States, primarily 90% are grown in California that we ship overseas. And almonds is a very flexible nut. It's, it's good in ingredients as far as uh, almond flour. Uh, it's in the baking industry. Uh, snack food is, is, a, is a segment that's really increasing. It's got a high protein. It's got uh, over, over nine grams of protein per ounce. Uh, it has a shelf life of over two years. And so, uh, you know, we're seeing almonds uh, growth in, in third world countries, uh, South America, Asia, Vietnam. Uh, the main importers have been uh, India, uh, the Middle East. Uh, we sell a lot into uh, Western Europe. And then China up until, you know, recently with the, with the tariff uh, situation was a large importer of almonds. They initially evolved as a, you know, cavity bees inside of trees, and so they evolved a response to forest fires that, you know, if there's a forest fire that comes through, it might burn down your tree where your cavity is. And so when bees smell smoke, their natural response is to basically get ready to flee in case they have to reestablish the hive somewhere else. So one of the first things they do is they gorge on honey and build up their fat reserves and the like. And when they're doing that, it chills them out really nicely. All right, let's get that ladder set up. You may have seen a, a, a clump of bees sitting out on a tree branch, right? Or a fence post or on the side of a house. And that's a bee swarm. When bees come out of the winter, they are at their very lowest uh, population size. And when the spring, when the first blooms come out, what the bees do is they start pollinating like crazy. They go out there, they gather nectar, they gather pollen, they bring it back to the hive and they put all of that food into making baby bees, right? Building that brood up. And the hive grows and grows and grows until it peaks in the early, mid, uh, early summer, late spring. Now what can happen is in some hives, that population can get so big that there are too many bees for the queen to manage. Uh, the queen kind of manages the bees through the use of pheromones and behaviors. And if the hive gets so large that her pheromones cannot be effectively distributed, she'll get feedback that the hive is very large. And what she will do is she will deposit an egg into a queen cell, which will develop into a new queen. Right before that queen cell emerges or hatches and produces the new adult queen, the old queen will take about 40, 60% of the workers in the hive, which can be 20, 40,000 bees. And she'll take all those bees and she will flood out of that hive, take all those workers with her to go and establish a new hive somewhere else. They'll fly around. Um, they usually stay relatively close, maybe 500 yards from the original hive. And they'll land on a tree limb, you know, a fence post, something like that hang out there while the workers search around for a hive site. And once they find a hive site, they will come back to the, uh, the, the swarm. They'll do a little waggle dance to show where the site is. And that whole swarm will basically pick up and fly off to the new site. The new queen takes over the old hive site. The old queen creates a new hive somewhere else. They're entirely on the other side of the... Uh Next uh, stud. Oh, okay. Yeah. Holy. Oh, for the almond pollination, this uh, Sylvan Oaks, they hired me to pollinate their crop. And so we're bringing our, you know, premium or strong hives so that we pollinate the blooming flowers so they get the almond crop.
So basically, these are all the future generation, the capped bees right here. So they're gonna hatch soon because the capping is dark. The baby bee larva is still in the cell. If you look inside, it's uh, like a uh, white color. All of this honey that, 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 uh, that we have here is all grown between Prather and Shaver. There are no chemicals, no pesticides of any kind. It's 100% pure raw honey, unprocessed. I've been here in this one location here for six and a half years. I get people from San Diego, from all over Los Angeles, from Reno, from San Francisco, from uh, Oakland, and Bakersfield, all around. They come by here, they know exactly where I'm at, because I never change locations. I'm here seven days a week. All, all the honey, that any honey that you choose here is going to be good for energy or allergies. It's 100% pure. Honey is a sugar solution. It's uh, also bee vomit. It's, that's, that's what it is. My, my four-year-old is fond of saying that it is his favorite insect vomit, uh, which my wife does not care for. But uh, essentially what honey is, is it's super concentrated nectar. Nectar is a sugar solution that is a reward the bees receive from the plant for pollinating. The bees take that nectar back to the hive and then they regurgitate it into the cells. They um, suck it up and they regurgitate it multiple times. That aerates it, that helps it evaporate, but it also adds some important enzymes. And what those enzymes do is they take complex plant sugars and they break them down into sucrose and glucose, very simple sugars. Um, and they also add some hydrogen peroxide and some antibacterial compounds uh, you may have heard of medicinal honey, right? Uh, medicinal honey, which you can apply to cuts, and it's essentially an antibiotic. And a major component of that is that honey has low amounts of hydrogen peroxide in it, which is antibacterial, antifungal. Now we have different varieties of honey. We have the mountain wildflower. We have the pomegranate. We have the alfalfa. We have sage. We have avocado. Avocado honey? Yeah, avocado honey. What's, that, what's that all about? It's honey. It just it all comes from the flower. You know? it's, a, it's not a real sweet honey. It's, it's it's kind of a mild, but a lot of people just love it. Now, Joe, are you ever do you eat the honey? Yes, sir. I came to Richard about four years ago. I used to suffer with terrible, terrible migraines. I went to the doctor. He gave me all kinds of medicine for the migraines. Nothing made it go away. Somebody in the church told me about honey, raw honey. And I saw Richard when he was over there on Shields. And I started buying the honey from him. He told me how to take it. The headaches are gone. Within like six months, they were completely gone. Haven't had a migrant headache since. Now your, uh, your sage and your buckwheat are the two highest in healing properties. They're good for for tea, for coffee, for energy, for allergies, for cooking, for baking, for female problems, for ulcers, for colon problems. They're all around. And your dark honeys are very, very good for iron. Well, uh, one of the first stages of uh, making wine, obviously, is when the vineyards uh, start leafing out and they actually flower. Very few people know that there are grape flowers, and it's a heavenly scent. And uh, grapes don't need bees to pollinate. They're self-pollinating, but, but the bees don't know that. So when we're out there during the flowering stage, the bees are profuse. And you would think, since we have six different varieties, that they're cross-pollination of Cabernet Sauvignon with Cabernet Franc, with Malbec, with Merlot, with Petit Verdot, with would change the uh, flavor of the wine every year. But if you think about it, what are the bees doing? They're pollinating the flowers. It does not change the offspring, but it does change the seed within all of those grapes. Those grapes stay the same, they don't change. But the seeds, now if you were to take the seeds out of those grapes and plant them, you'd get an entirely different vine than anything in the vineyard because it'd be cross-pollinated 
the seed, the embryo itself, is what they cross-pollinate. So what we're seeing, right, is up there along the top of this uh, beam, they built their pump. As you can tell that this hive's been here for a while, see all this folded up stuff at the bottom? Those are old collapsed combs that they don't use anymore. Those uh, probably in the summer heat, you know, they lost their adhesion to the top beam and fell down, or maybe there was, used to be a hive here that was abandoned, died out, and those ones aged and fell down. But either way, it's a decent sized comb. What we're seeing out on this outside edge, that's all honeycomb. That's where the leakage was coming from. Uh, you can see all those um, nice white cap cells. That's all mature honey uh, that's ready to be uh, consumed. There were a couple problems with the hive. Uh, one thing was we opened it up and there was no evidence of brood, that is immature bees. The queen will lay her eggs inside of uh, cells inside the hive and they will develop and they will be capped. And when you just look at a hive, if you know what a comb looks like, you can easily tell when there is an active queen that is laying healthy brood. And we did not see any evidence of that. Probably had a swarm come in earlier this season. They smelled all that old comb that was down at the bottom. Uh, they established a hive. They did okay for a little while, got a couple generations, and then something happened that killed the queen. Who knows what? But once the queen dies, if there's already some brood in there and some eggs, you've got about three, four weeks before they're going to emerge as workers. And then those workers are going to live for another 50, 60 days. And so the fact that we open that up, there's virtually no brood except for the drones, which are the longest living, the, the longest developing brood. But there's a lot of workers in here. My guess is it's just all the workers that are left over from that initial hive and they're just living off of the stored resources. That's sort of the unfortunate thing. When you don't have the queen, they're not going to follow her. And so there's not a whole lot you can do about it at that point. They're just going to, it's basically a done for hive. The reason the bees are along roads is because that's where the growers want them. And everybody knows you're just slaughtering bees when you drive through there and you have all the honey and nectar on your windshield. And so it's, if they could move them in a couple rows, you know, where they're in the trees, that'd be great. But it, the beekeepers set them where the growers want them. And, and if they're outside the orchard a little bit, they get more sun. So the theory for that is they fly sooner. People have also been interested in honeybees just because they're an interesting social model, right? Uh, if you look at bees, they all operate together in such a, a cohesive um, fashion. It, it almost can, it feels like a mirror of, of human society. There are essentially three castes of honeybees. There is the queen bee, and there's only ever one queen bee. And the queen bee is the reproductive. She lays all the eggs. She also, uh, you know, basically keeps the, uh, the workers as a cohesive whole through pheromones. There are workers, which are also females. Uh, workers are unmated females, and they do all the work in the hive. And workers have lots of different jobs that they transition through as they age. Uh, right after they're born, workers typically become nurse bees. They live in the brood comb and they take care of uh, their young sisters who are just being uh, laid and are developing. Uh, but ultimately, what all worker bees will become are foragers that go out and search for resources. And beyond that, then there are the drones. And drones are male bees, and male bees don't do anything. Uh, <laughs> male, bees, male bees mate with the queens, and that's it. Uh, otherwise, they hang out in the brood comb, and they kind of eat the pollen, and uh, they're- They're just kind of laying on the couch watching they, TV. They are, and it's, it's, it's a cozy life right up until autumn, uh, when the hive is preparing for winter. And they basically, uh, they, they don't want to support these lazy drones all winter when they can't get more resources, and so they kind of push them all out. <laughs> It's a, it's a bad time to be a drone, unfortunately. Say, say that again. Richard is almost 90 years old. 88, right? No, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be 90. You'll be 90 this year? Yeah, November. 90 years old. Well, that's a pretty good testimony right and there. He sets right? up, he sets this up every day. He takes it, puts it up every day. Every morning he comes, sets it up. In the evenings he picks it up. And then he bottles it in the evenings. So. 
He's quite a man. <laughs> and he's working. <laughs> That's awesome, you guys. Production funding for American Grown, My Job Depends on Ag, provided by James G. Parker Insurance Associates, insuring and protecting agribusiness for over 40 years. By Garv Bennett, the growing experts in water, irrigation, nutrition, and crop care advice and products. We help growers feed the world. By Golden State Farm Credit, building relationships with rural America by providing ag financial services. By Brandt, professional agriculture proudly supporting the heroes that work hard to feed a hungry world every day. By Unwired Broadband, today's internet for rural Central California, keeping Valley agriculture connected since 2003. By Hodges Electric, proudly serving the Central Valley since 1979. And by Valley Air Conditioning and Repair, family owned for over 50 years, proudly featuring Coleman products, dedicated to supporting agriculture and the families that grow our nation's food.